Lord. Are you glad to be in church this morning? I got to warn you, I got a word from God, so you better just buckle up your seatbelt and get ready. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, get ready. If you got your Bible, go with me to the book of Mark. We're going to get right into it because they've given me 30 minutes. Come on. Mark, Mark 2 uh, is where we'll start, and then we're going to end up in Joshua 1. Mark 2, just uh, one scripture here, verse number 22. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, and he says this, And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. Jesus is addressing a mindset that the Pharisees had. They were challenging him about fasting. And they, in fact, they said, why do your followers not fast? John's followers fasted. Why are yours not fasting? And, and, and Jesus understands that they're not fasting because he's walking with them. And he says to them, there's going to be a time when I'm not walking with them physically on earth. And that'll be the time to fast. But he tells them, you've got an old mindset. And God's trying to do a new thing, but you can't receive it in your old mindset. And so he says, new wine needs a new wine skin. Joshua 1, Joshua 1, verse number 1, and we'll read a few more verses here in Joshua 1. It says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. And every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. And no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, because as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. If you're thankful for that, say amen. Verse number 10, we'll read two more verses. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go and possess the land which the Lord is giving you to possess. Joshua said, prepare provisions for the crossover. I want to preach to you this morning about preparing for your crossover. Look at your neighbor and say, you have to prepare for your crossover. Come on, if you're ready to hear from God, clap your hands. Come on, 9 a.m. Have I told you I like y'all better than the 11? If I haven't, I like you better. Come on. 40 years prior to the passage that we just read in Joshua 1, God had told his people, I am bringing you into the promised land. And this was a massive new concept to a people who all they had ever known was Egyptian bondage and lack. And, and here's God saying, I delivered you out of Egypt so that I can bring you into the promised land. And it's not going to be a place of bondage and lack. It's going to be a place of freedom and abundance. This was an incredible new idea that God dropped on his people. And I want to encourage someone today that your God is an out of and into God. God didn't just deliver you out of sin. He's got a plan to bring you into a place of promise. Jesus said it like this, I came to give you life, but I'm not just going to give you life. I'm going to give you life more abundantly. And I just came with a clarion call this morning for somebody that needs to hear it, that God is getting ready to cross you over out of your lack and into abundance, out of your bondage and into freedom. And if somebody's ready for life more abundantly, you ought to give God praise right here for that. Yeah, God's got a plan for your life. 
The word of God says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. I'm thankful for a God that's prepared a place of promise for me. He said, I'm bringing you out of and into a place of promise. But you remember the story, the Israelites get to the border of the promised land and it's tragic because they see the inhabitants of the land. They said they look like giants and we're grasshoppers. And they began to doubt the word of God. Why? Because they trusted what they saw in spite of what they'd heard God say. But people of faith understand that we walk by faith and not by sight. And faith comes by hearing and by hearing of the word of God. And I got to preach to somebody that's staring at a giant and staring at a Jordan. That whenever the giant looks you in the eyes, you got to remember what you heard and forget what you see. Because God's going to get you through if he said he's going to get you through. Somebody praise him like you trust him what you heard. Come on. It was their lack of faith that caused them not to cross over. Doubt and disbelief cost them. And I want to tell someone that disobedience will cost you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but, but just see what it cost them. 40 years of wandering the wilderness. The wilderness is a tragic season because when you're wandering the wilderness, you're not taking any ground. You're walking in circles. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a life where I just wander in circles from week to week. But I want to be somebody, a person of God that steps into a place of promise where I'm taking ground for the kingdom of heaven and making a difference on earth. I'm looking for a few Joshua's in this place to take a minute and give God some praise like you're going to be a person of promise. I'm not going to let disobedience cost me the plan of God for my life. And the thing about a wilderness season is, and we've all been there, I've been there, that it's our disobedience that gets us in it. God doesn't just throw you into the wilderness and says, I'll be back in 40 years. No, God lets you wander as long as you want to wander. As long as you want to disobey him, as long as you want to do your own thing, as long as you want to put him on the back burner, God will let you wander in circles. And this people wandered for 40 years. Years And the Bible said God waited until that generation of doubters died off. And when doubt died off, a people of faith began to rise up. And I want to encourage somebody with this that's been wandering in a wilderness. That your doubt may have got you in it, but your faith can get you out of it. Come on, I'm telling somebody, it may seem like you've wasted time, but you've got a God that said, I can restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. Don't let yesterday's doubt keep you from today's faith because today's faith can get you in your crossover season. Look at your neighbor and say, he about to preach all over this place. I'm in the warm-up right now. Come on, we're not even in the good stuff. Don't let yesterday's doubt keep you from believing God today. It's never too late to believe God. Woo. Doubt will get you in the wilderness, but faith will get you out. But it cost them, cost them 40 years of wandering, never taking ground. And an entire generation dies off. And now God says, it's time, it's time. I've got a people that will listen to me. I've got a people of faith and it's time to cross over. Watch what God does. God says, before I can shift you into the place of promise, I have to shake things up. Because Moses, you can't lead this people into the promised land. Moses, your time is up. And the Bible said that Moses died. And this is significant. Because they had seen a lot of people die in the desert, an entire generation. But Moses is different. Moses is the miracle man. Moses is the one that they went to with all their problems, all their concerns. Moses was their shepherd in the desert. Moses was the one they depended on. Moses was the one they looked to. And now Moses is dead. Sometimes God will remove the things we thought we needed to show us that he's all we really need. That was worth the trip to church this morning. God will let some things die. God will let some relationships be removed. 
because he's causing you to cross over into something better. And watch what happens. They had looked to Moses for everything. They looked to him for water and he brought it from a rock. They looked to him to split the sea. Moses split the sea. They looked to him for, for years. They looked to Moses. And now God has forced them to look in another direction. God has pushed them to a place that they would not have got on their own. If Moses was still alive, they'd still be looking to Moses. But now Moses is dead and they have to look somewhere else. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the times that God pushed me. I'm thankful for the times when God knew I was too scared, too afraid, too timid to step out by faith. And so he removed all my other options till the only option I had was to step out and God pushed me. I wonder if there's anybody that'll praise the Lord today for the times that he pushed you. Because you know you wouldn't be here today if God hadn't pushed you into your crossover. Oh, somebody, you ought to get ready because God said, I'm about to push you into your crossover season. <laughs> I'm thankful for the push. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, get ready for the push. I, I heard a story about a rich man that lives somewhere out in Texas, and he invited a bunch of his business associates and people that wanted to do business with him. He's highly successful. And he invited their wives and he invited all their families, like, bring everybody out. We're going to have a barbecue and a pool party. And so everybody shows up, come to his house, and it's amazing. It's immaculate. And he's showing everybody his house, and this is my movie theater. Come on. This is my elevator. This is my bowling alley. It's incredible. He said, but y'all are here for a pool party. He said, just wait. So you see my pool. So they go outside to the back, and when they come outside, their jaws drop to the floor because they look out at an Olympic-sized pool that's filled with alligators. <laughs> and they said, uh, why is your pool filled, and I mean filled, with alligators? And he said, well, because the one thing I admire most in people that I do business with is courage. And so they just shook their heads and started to turn around and go back in the house. He said, but I got to tell you, I got to tell you, if somebody will jump in that pool and swim from one end to the other, I'll write you a million dollar check today. And they looked at those alligators and said, absolutely not. Turned back around, started walking back in the house. And when they turned around, they heard splash. And they looked back and there was a dude cutting through that water like Michael Phelps. Come on, somebody. Alligators just snapping at his feet. And when he came up out of the water on the other side, he's all out of breath. And that rich man ran up to me and said, oh my goodness, I have never seen such a display of courage. I got your check ready. Who do I need to make the check out to? And that man's leaned over like this and he looks up. He said, sir, right now, I just want to know why my wife pushed me in. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. I'm thankful for the push. I'm thankful for the times that God got behind me and said, you're going to miss this blessing if I don't push you towards it. And I've come to prophetically declare in your life that God's getting ready to push you into your cross. So somebody that's ready for the push, get on your feet like you came for some church and give God a praise uh, that he'll push you when you need to be You're scared of the water, Peter, but God's going to push you and you're going to find out when you get out there in faith that God will sustain you. I'm thankful for the push. Come on, sit down. I'm running out of time. I got 16 minutes. I'm not even in my message yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Joshua's in charge now. And Joshua, I love Joshua because he wastes no time. Moses spent 40 years catering to these folks. And Joshua gets the charge from God. And Joshua says, all right, everybody, you got three days. Pack your stuff. Get your house in order because we're crossing over. Oh, come on. If we just had a few Joshua's in the church, if we just had a few people that say in this season we can't waste any more time, we got to get serious about what God is doing. I can't hit, skip, and miss church. I got to be consistent in this season because we're getting ready for a crossover like we've never seen before. And I came to declare it that Champions is about to cross over out of where we've been and into a place of prompt. 
Oh, get ready for your crossover. Joshua, watch this, watch this, this is huge. I want you to put verse number 11 on the screens. Joshua says, prepare provisions for yourselves. That word for provisions is the word seda, seda. The word seda means food. So Joshua says, prepare food for yourself. And this is a revolutionary statement for a people that had just spent 40 years in the desert eating food that they never had to prepare for themselves. I got to get on the floor for this one. Look at your neighbor and say, you better watch out. Get your toes ready. Hope you wore steel-toed boots. I'm just playing. This is a statement that you could almost gloss over in this passage if you don't understand the history of this people. For 40 years, God had provided miraculously for them in the area of their food. The Bible said, and this is a fascinating subject when you, when you study it out, that every morning except on the Sabbath when they walked out of their tent, there was manna, food, on the ground that God had sent waiting on them manna is an interesting word the word manna literally means what is it next time your spouse prepares you a meal just look at her and say this is manna from heaven come on what is it (laughs) manna is interesting it means what is it and the bible tries to describe to us what it is it says it's almost like a snowflake if you never read that it's people say it's bread but it's really looks more like a flake and, and manna, God gave special stipulations. He said, he said, whenever you gather the manna, gather according to the need of your tent. In other words, God didn't distribute it equally. The greater the capacity of the tent, the greater the blessing. The greater the appetite of the household, the greater the blessing. And I want to remind somebody that God isn't going to bless you just because you showed up this morning. God is going to bless you because you showed up hungry this morning. That's why Jesus said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be fed. And I just want to know, are there any hungry people that came to church who say, I can't go another day without the bread from heaven. I can't go another day without a touch from God. Let the hungry people give God some praise. Oh, I'm hungry for revival. I'm hungry for a move of God in my generation. God responds to appetite. He said, when you gather the manna, gather according to the need of your tent. And then the second thing he said about manna, which is fascinating, is he said, don't try to keep it overnight. And of course, like us, they did exactly what he told them not to do. And they tried to, they said, let's see what happens. They tried to hoard it and keep it overnight. And the next morning, the Bible said it was rotten. Had maggots in it. Which, remember this, because this is important for where we're going in the next 11 minutes. Manna doesn't keep. And so you have a people that have been raised on manna. Manna that was waiting on them outside of their tent. Manna that they didn't have to hunt for. Which, by the way, I'm not, very, I'm not a very good hunter. Come on. We went on a coyote hunt uh, before my wedding. And let me tell you, there's no safer place to be a coyote than when you're in the field that I'm in. Come on, somebody. Because I didn't hit nothing. I'm not a hunter. My dad took us fishing growing up. I can do a little bit of that. But this is not a food they ever had to hunt for. This is not a crop they had to harvest. It's not something they had to sow for or reap for. And it fell every morning like clockwork. This is a generation, remember, that didn't know Egypt. They didn't know the fish and the meats and the leeks and the herbs and the garlic the Bible talks about. They didn't know that part of Egypt. All they knew was the desert. And I want to spend a few minutes right here talking about desert babies. Because this was a generation of desert babies that had never had to prepare a meal for themselves. And Joshua looks at this generation that had spent its life looking to heaven and waiting on manna. And he says, this next meal 
won't come easy. This next meal is going to require your involvement. This next meal requires your sweat. This next meal, come on, this next meal won't come like the man. You're going to have to prepare your food for yourselves. And I'm here with a prophetic word that when it's time for you to cross over from life to life more abundantly, God says, I made it happen for you up to this point, but I won't make it happen without you anymore. I'm telling somebody, you got to sow today for what you're going to reap tomorrow. You got to prepare today for the provision of tomorrow. Your crossover depends on it. Oh, God is weaning a generation of desert babies off of consumer Christianity. Because in this season, God doesn't need a desert baby. God needs a person of faith that will step into the promise and claim everything that he said we'd have. Come on, God's weaning somebody off of easy. You wonder why things are difficult. God said, I'm weaning you because I'm pushing you because you're crossing over. Oh, I wish somebody would preach with me this morning like God is a God that knows how to wean you into your next. Desert babies. Consume only and never contribute. Now, I got to qualify this real quick. If you're a new believer, we're, we're just thankful you're here. I'm not talking about you. God bless you. You'll figure this thing out. We're going to help you do it. If you don't believe in any of this I'm talking about, you're not a Christian, God bless you. We're thankful you're here. But I'm talking about desert babies. Folks that have been around for 40 years. Folks that have been coming to church for 40 years. And they only consume. And they never contribute. I want you just real quick. I got eight minutes, so we're almost done anyway. Just stand with me real quick. Come on, all, everybody. Everybody. This is, a, this is an exercise. Interactive. Come on. Now, I want you to reach back on the seat you just stood up front and, and just feel it. Feel it. Come on. Do it real quick. Feel it. Feel that? That warm spot is not your only contribution to this church. Oh, come on. We've had a whole generation that wants to show up and say, God bless me. God heal me. But you haven't given, haven't tithed, hadn't worshiped, hadn't prayed. But God said, I'm weaning my church off of easy. And I'm looking for some soldiers that say, I'm going to prepare before it happens. I'm going to shout before it happens. I'm going to give before it happens. I'm going to be a part of the breakthrough. Somebody take 10 seconds. And just give God a praise that's preparation for what he's about to do. Oh, yes. Desert babies wait on God to move. People of faith prepare for God to move. I'm not waiting, baby. I'm preparing. When you see me in this season, just know I'm preparing. I can't fool around with just anybody in this season because I'm prepping. I can't talk crazy in this season because I'm prepping. I can't do what I used to do in this. Oh, come on, because I'm prepping. I wonder if there's anybody that's prepping for what God is about to do in your life. I'm reading books because I'm prepping. I'm back in school because I'm prepping. I'm studying real estate because I'm prepping. I come to tell somebody, you have to dress for where you're going. You got to dress for where you're going. I remember when, and, I, and I'm done in six minutes, so just stay standing. Worship team, y'all come on, it's going to help me. I remember when I got married the night before. I was so nervous. I laid out my whole outfit, socks, shiny shoes, white coat, all of it. I laid it out, why? Not because it was time to get married, but because I was preparing for where I was going. Some of y'all want a blessing, but you haven't laid out anything. Some of you want God to bless you financially, and God says you better get on a budget, because if I blessed you financially, you'd waste it. I'm preaching. I want to get closer to God, but your old prayer life's not going to get it done. You want to get closer to God, you got to give God something to work with. And I remember the day of my wedding, got my suit on, white coat, and I'm, I, I'm one of those people, I will, I will drive on empty for 37 miles. Come on, somebody. And I've been going about 36 miles on empty. And I said, I got to get some gas or I'm going to be broke down before the wedding. And so I pull over to the stop and go. And I'm in my full-blown suit. And have you ever been in a situation like that where you know everybody's looking at you crazy? 
I'm in a white coat pumping gas at the stop and go. And you just want to tell everybody, I'm not dressed for where I'm at. I'm dressed for where I'm going. Oh, that's why the Bible says for the spirit of heaviness, put on a garment of praise. Why? Not because it's easy, but because it won't be hard forever. I'm dressed. I'm dressed for where I'm going. Somebody ought to get a praise together for where you're going. You ought to get a worship together for where you're going. Get a prayer life together. You got to dress for where you're going. God said, tell somebody, dress for where they're going. You don't wait to praise God. You praise God before it happens. He told me to tell somebody, you got to learn four minutes. Learn the language of your future. If all you know is the language of where you're at, that's all you'll ever be. You have to learn the language, not of the room you're in, but of the room you're about to be in. You got to learn the language of your future. Bible says you got to call the things that are not as though they were. The Bible says let the weak say I am strong. Why? Not because I feel strong, but because I won't be weak forever. I just learned the language of my future. That's why people don't understand your praise. Because they don't understand you've learned the language of your future. They look at your life and say you're wasting time. But you just learned the language of your... Somebody up in here, I wish you'd take a minute and call the things that are not as though they were. Where are my faith people? Faith makes a plan. Faith prepares. Faith doesn't fly by the seat of its pants. Kooky, charismatic people, and God bless them, but they just think being led by the Holy Ghost means just doing whatever, whenever. God makes a plan. God had a plan for salvation. God had a plan to release his spirit. God is a God who makes a plan. I got three minutes to bring this home. Wine and wineskins. Wine is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. You remember on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number two, they said, these are drunk on wine. Peter looked at him and said, no, these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel that in the last days I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. He said, we're not drunk as you suppose. We just got the new wine. New wine is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God is getting ready to pour out new wine in your life and pour out new wine over this church as a whole. But we have to give God somewhere to pour it. The Bible said when they got to the promised land, the manna ceased. They had to learn how to prepare their next meal because the next one wasn't going to fall from heaven. I never want to be a believer that's looking up for something that's not falling. You cannot go into your new season with the old mindset. I could spend time there, but I'm not going to. You cannot try to get married with a single man's mindset. New wine needs a new wineskin. God brought somebody here to give him a space to operate. Because there are some systems in your life that are outdated. There are some structures in your life that are outdated. There are some relationships in your life that are outdated. And when you leave this service, you just need to text them. Your manna has ceased. Oh, yeah, you were good for me in that season. But you can't go with me in this season. Your manna has ceased. And God's got a crossover. God's got something more for my life. Somebody that believes it, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. Call the things that are not as though they were. Give them some new space to move in. Your old praise won't get it done. You better find a new one. Your old prayer life won't get it done. You got to find a new one. Some of y'all had the old dusty praise and prayer life for 75 years and God said it's time to do something new. Come on, sing to the Lord a new song. Every now and then you got to do something you've never done. Some of y'all have never lifted your hands, but if you lift your hands, God says there's a new wine skin and I can pour. Some of you have never shouted before, but if you learn to shout, not because I told you to, but because you understand that God has been so good, you can't contain your praise. If you learn to shout, God said there's a new wine skin. If you learn to give and tithe. God said, look at that. That's a new wine skin. And I'm going to open up the heavens and pour out. 
I'm preaching my face off. Somebody take 10 seconds and blow the roof off of this 9 a.m. church. I'm coming into this season with a new wine skin. I'm coming into this season with a new mindset. I got some new habits. I got some new consistency. Yeah, I got a new wine skin in this season. And last thing, because I'm negative seven seconds. I did pretty good. I technically, I still have seven, six minutes. Jesus said, you got to have a new wineskin because the old wineskin has lost its ability to stretch. And when that wine gets in there, the gases are released when it ferments and it stretches it to the point that it'll break if it's not a new wineskin. You have to adapt the ability to stretch your faith in this season. I'm going to preach the man with the withered hand in, in one minute flat. Jesus comes to the temple and there's a man with a withered hand. And he says to him, stretch out your hand. And I love this man because Jesus doesn't specify which hand to stretch out. The Bible said the man with the withered hand stretched his withered hand out. And God is looking for a people that will come to him and not try to hide your weaknesses and hide your faults and hide your old wineskin. But God is looking for a people that will bring that old wineskin to him and stretch it out and say, God, I'm ready to form something new. And Jesus healed that man and restored his hand. And I just declare it that God is about ready to restore some things back to your life. God is about ready to fill your wine skin if you give him something to fill. I'm done. Woo! I'm telling you, last summer we about doubled the size of this church. And this summer, I believe by faith, Pastor Chase, that we're going to see this crowd double once again. We're going to see more people saved than we've ever seen before. We're going to see more people delivered than we've ever seen before. We're going to see the new wine poured out because there is a people that said, I'm going to give God something to pour into. And I was going to do an altar response, but I'm going to just have you right there in your seat respond to this because this is what I want. I don't want you to live a desert baby life. Where you come in and the pastor hypes you up and you go home and never make a change. I want to see you cross over into the perfect plan God has for your life. And so I challenge you today to make a decision. Joshua says, today prepare for tomorrow. Do something today that positions you for the blessing tomorrow. Some of y'all that aren't giving, start giving. Some of y'all that you don't worship, start worshiping. You don't serve, you're not on the dream team, come to growth track, join the dream team. Give God a new skin to operate in. I challenge you to search your heart and find the place that you need to stretch out in. If you're in this room, why don't you just close your eyes and stretch them up to heaven. This morning, we're making a decision to give God a new wineskin. We can't take this old manna with us. We can't live off of yesterday's bread. God said, forget the former things. Behold, I'm getting ready to do a new thing. I want to be a part of the new thing that God is doing. And so right now, whatever that thing is that you need to stretch out, why don't you stretch it out to him and say, God, I'm willing and I'm ready to stretch in this area. I'm willing and I'm, weary and I'm ready to be a part of my next provision. I understand that if I'm going to cross over, you're not going to make it happen without me. But God, I give you my life today. I give you my faith today. Wherever you'd have me go, whatever you'd have me do, I'm giving you a new wine skin. And I'm expecting the new wine to be poured out. If that's you in this place with every hand lifted as we begin to sing, why don't you believe that right now? Why don't you declare it right now that the new wine is being poured out? That if you give them a container, He'll pour out his wine. Oh, I feel the faith in the room. He's getting ready to cross you over. Come on, give him something to work with. Give him a new wine skin. Prepare your food for the journey. Dress for where you're going. Learn the language of your future.
comes your push. Here comes your push.